this the door is this the day the Lord has made let us read huh rejoice and be glad in it what does that mean is it just being happy just being happy I wonder if things are really going bad you still rejoice huh what if you lose everything oh my well this is going to be a, this has been a rough couple months for me spiritually because the Lord has been dealing with the things that need to change in my own life so if, if you pardon me if I mention myself a little bit it's uh, God has been very gracious very kind but uh, I've been put in mind of those days back in 69, 1969. I just realized, did the math, it shocked me. 60 years ago. Oh, my goodness. No, 1969 and 19, this is 2019. Well, thank you. You just gave me 10 years. Thank you. I was worried about that. I thought I did the math right, you know. But the Lord has been very merciful. But that time, my faith really didn't flourish until my dad kicked me out of the house. We had a nice middle-class house, and he felt it was time for me to get on my own. And so he sent me out to an uncertain future to Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Florida. And I, I left it all behind. And I was scared as a chicken when... Uh, hawk comes flying over. I don't know if we have chickens around and you should see the chickens scatter when so somehow some, the chickens sometimes I think are wiser than I am. Because when the hawk flies over and goes, caw, caw, what do the chickens do? They go running into the coop where it's safe. Well, that's what I did. I ran to Jesus. And while in Fort Lauderdale, I ran into some Jesus freaks. And that was a change. That was a big change. Was it pure chance that they stopped to give me a ride while I was on the streets? They always hitchhiking? I don't think so. Was it hap that when they pulled over and gave me a ride, they said, praise the Lord. They were all excited for Jesus. I think it was providence. Because I learned, back then, I learned to trust God. I learned there was a fire in my soul for Jesus, for people. I was passionate about the soon return of Jesus. Jesus is coming soon. One way, man. There was an urgency in every moment, no matter what or where I was. I lived in community with many brethren who lived and breathed Jesus every moment. We, had, we lived uh, an Acts 2.44 life. You know what that is? Huh? We had all things common and provided anyone in need a place to stay and to eat and find faith in Christ. We were on fire. And I realize now more than ever how blessed I was to witness firsthand the providing power of unhindered trust. Our little ministry grew from 20 to 200 to 2,000 before we had to get another house. Then another house and another house. A place in Fort Lauderdale, Gainesville, Florida, if you're not familiar with Florida, Tallahassee, the capital, even in Macon, Georgia, and over in uh, Montgomery, Alabama, at a place in Haiti and Dominican Republic. Amen. It was amazing. There on the beach, it, it was electric, really. It was electric. Uh, we were seeing young people come to the Lord in droves. They're right there on the beaches of Fort Lauderdale. We're witnessing passing out tracks. And we baptized in the Atlantic Ocean. That was really cool. We didn't have to go finding a pool, you know. We just, there's the ocean. It's free. Let's do it. And people were getting saved. We sang hymns together. We studied the Bible together. I didn't lose a button together, but there it is. And uh, we were high on Jesus, man. We were high on Jesus. And uh, it was amazing. We studied. I was able to visit some of the 
dark streets in Haiti a couple times and live in Dominican Republic with the community. They're together with 12 of my colleagues in the same house. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? You know, it's a different community lifestyle is different, totally different. But that, but my faith was hot, and this went on for a whole decade. But the Lord only knows what kind of impact that we had on His kingdom. You know, back back then when I was in my twenties, we we just all we knew was Jesus. All we knew is that He had changed our life. All we knew is that He can change your life too. You know, come on, let's go, go to let's go to the coffee house and sing. Sing songs and, and and praise the Lord, and uh, well, I left a mark on my soul today. I left a mark that I can never, well, I shouldn't ever forget. And I'm thinking of some Bible characters who left it behind. Can you think of some? What about what about Joseph? What did he leave behind? His that's what we're getting to. His coat. In Potiphar's wife's hand, right? Uh, Moses left the courts of Pharaoh. Abraham. Ah, Abraham. All right. Elisha. What about Elisha? What did he leave behind? Is what? He left. Elisha, when he was called, left the bullock, his bull, and the plow. And what did he do with the plow? He broke it up, right? And he sacrificed on it and left the family farm to follow the prophet. Wow. And also I'm thinking this year, in 2019, marks the 500th anniversary of the landing of the pilgrims on Plymouth. You know that? They left what? They, well, the reason they left was because the persecution. persecution. They had to leave it behind. Was they going to a familiar place, a safe place? No. And then I'm thinking of um, Roger Williams, after, uh, who was right there in the same time. But he left his pulpit in Boston to go and found a colony, a little tiny place called Rhode Island. Did you know he was a Sabbatarian? And uh, he did, uh, he felt that the church the Puritan church in Boston was too much like the church they had left for persecution. So he went and founded the little town of Providence, which is now one of the prime cities. They left everything behind. How about William Miller? D disappointment. He had to deal with something that and leave that thought behind and go on and believe that there is something different, something, something better than there is at the moment. They left everything behind for a cause. And I submit to you this morning, dear family, that they all walked away. They ran away in, and drove away, whatever, to an unknown country. And I consider the unknown country would have been the cross Yes, the cross where the old life dies and resurrection life begins. And this is what it means to be at the crossroads. And that's what I felt. I left home behind into an unknown place, and the Lord had something better for me. Have you ever been there? Ever seen yourself walking the pages of the Bible? Perhaps like David in the cave of Adullam. Or in the pit with Elijah. Or perhaps you felt that you betrayed Jesus, like Judas Iscariot. Uh, for several months, I found myself walking the fields of Boaz in my heart. I'm gleaning from the hot barley fields of desperation and hunger. Honestly, I feel like I've been like Naomi returning to Israel, very bitter. I've been like Ruth, ready to cleave to my Messiah, my redeeming relative. And I must consider if I could be even Boaz and surrender all of my inheritance to an unknown heir. Everything we have is going to be left behind. 
everything we have is going to be left behind. So why is it so scary, leaving everything behind? Today we're going to spend some time here in, in Ruth and look at the lives of some, at least two of the main characters. We have Ruth, Naomi, actually in order, Naomi, Ruth, and Boaz. I don't have time this morning to go into Boaz's consecrated life, but let's examine the book of Ruth, which is as... Pastor Kenman mentioned that it was right after the book of Judges and before 1 Samuel. Now, did you know that many of the Jewish Bibles include Ruth? They, they fold it into as a, just another chapter of Judges. And that would give hope and encouragement to a very, you could say if you read Judges, it's kind of strange and very hard to, hard to be encouraged sometimes. Because as we see there, everyone did what was right in their own eyes because there was no king. There was no king. In the book of Ruth, we find these three people who left everything behind, everything. Naomi left her daughters-in-law and any possible livelihood. She released them. We'll get to that in a moment. Ruth left her profession, her, her people, and her posterity. That is, she left her past. She left her present. And, he left, and she left any hope of, of the future to an unknown future. Naomi lived in Bethlehem, Judea. Let me say this. You cannot possess anything until you release everything. You will not possess anything until you release everything. And so we have Naomi, who lived in Bethlehem, Judea, with her husband, Amalek, and two sons. They were blessed. And it was a very pleasant household. And her very name, Nehemiah, her name means my pleasantness. And parents name their children for a character or something that's almost prophetic. And so living with Naomi must have been a very pleasant experience. And I can imagine her family being really blessed by her presence. Amalek, Elimelech, excuse me. You know, his name means he is my God, my king, or God is my king. That really, if you think about it, during the time of Judges, was there a king? No. There was no king during the time of Judges. So Amalek's name was really kind of like an indictment of all Israel because they didn't want a king. They didn't have a king. All they wanted to do was uh, do whatever they wanted to do. They had no king because they refused to make God their king. And I submit that they had nothing because they gave nothing. They gave nothing. And so we see in the opening scene in the book of Ruth, a famine in Bethlehem. The house of bread, which is the name of Bethlehem, had no bread. Elimelech led his family to the enemy's camp in Moab. Took his sons, and they married foreign wives, Orpah and Ruth. And the pleasant time together was very brief. What happened? Elimelech and both his sons died. Could you imagine that? What tragedy. Do you know Moab means the father of my son is my father? That's Moab. That's the land where they lived. Did you get that? The father of the father of my child is my father. And this is the land of incest where they lived and attempted to thrive. And they knew it was time to leave. Now there was not one widow, but three. But three. Imagine the grief and poverty. So they left. After being there ten years, they left Moab, returning home empty and destitute. She was a widow faced with a double emptiness. 
No husband, no future. No heir. All she had were two foreign daughters-in-law, both widows like herself. It would be expected that these daughters would provide comfort and care for Naomi. They were indeed daughters-in-law. No wonder she refused to be called Naomi, which is pleasant. But when she returned home, she said, Don't call me Naomi, call me Mara. Bitter. Yet, if you look at her life closely, she did not blame God for her grief. Instead, she left all security behind. She left it behind and released her daughters to a brighter future. We read in verse 11 and 13 of of, of Ruth, chapter 1. Listen to how Naomi deals with this. And Naomi said, or you can go there if you wish, Ruth 1, verses 11 through 13. And Naomi said, turn again, my daughters. Why will ye go with me? Are there yet any more sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Turn again, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband also tonight and should also bear sons, would you tarry for them till they have grown? Would you stay with them from having husbands? Nay, my daughters, for it grieveth me much for your sakes. Did you get that? Her mind was on them, not her. This is a widow trying to return to Bethlehem. And she's saying, turn again, turn again, my daughters. There is a better future for you. I leave you behind. I leave you behind. She says, and the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Many times the greatest testimony only comes after the greatest test. I feel this just may be a test for Naomi in her desperate loss. By the hand of providence, Naomi is presented with these great tests. So what do you do when you lose everything? What do you do? What would you do? Hmm. No love, there's no faith, no hope. But Naomi, like her name, proved that the darkest cloud brings the most pleasant shower. The darkest cloud can bring the most pleasant shower. Hallelujah. Oh, the height of charity, the force of faith, and the audacity of hope. Naomi forsook her own comfort for the sake of her own, for her daughter's security. Turn again, turn again, my daughters. Now, could I be so bold and be so unselfish? Releasing Orpah and Ruth from their legal bond. There was a legal bond there. She released them, opened the door for an unforeseen recompense. Mark that word, recompense. We're going to get into that. Recompense. Naomi could not see the city whose builder and maker was God, but she knew it was there somewhere out there in the fields of Bethlehem. It was her piety and love for God that rang the heartstrings of Ruth. Thus, Naomi's test became the testimony of Ruth's own life. Now, Ruth protested her dismissal. She said, Oh, by the way, her name means friend or friendship or neighbor. You get the picture? A neighbor who is a friend, who is a good friend and, and relative. It's the same name in the Hebrew, neighbor, that, that her name comes from, as we see in Leviticus 19.18. What does that say? Thou shalt love thy neighbor. Same word, Ruth, neighbor, as thyself. I am the Lord. Jesus said in Matthew 16, 25, For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. What did Ruth lose? 
And what did she gain? The answer to both questions? Everything. She lost everything, and then she gained everything. So we see in verse 14 of the first chapter of Ruth, we witness the deep emotional trauma of separation and despair. And at the same time, there's a brilliant beam of hope rising over the shepherd folds of Bethlehem. We read in Ruth 1.14, And they lifted up their voice and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law. But Ruth clave unto her. Mark that word, clave. Mark that word, clave. Oh, the tears of separation ran down the cheeks like death. But Ruth would not relent. She would leave her life behind and cling to the one hope she knew of. The one thing that she did not see, but yet she clung to it. The hope of Messiah, the Redeemer. Now the word cleave is the exact word used to convey the intimate covenant of marriage and union found in the wedding of Eve and Adam. Same word. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Genesis 2.24 Hallelujah. Please grasp this picture. Ruth is using this super glue of love and devotion that will not separate, no, will not ever divide her covenant love to her mother-in-law. Let's read verses 16 and 17 again. Here it is in chapter 1 of Ruth. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following thee, for whither thou goest, I will go. Whither thou go lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God, my God. Where thou diest, look at this, thou diest, will I die, and where will I be buried? And the Lord do so to me, even more so, if aught but death part thee and me. Anything aught but death part me and thee, thee and me. Do you understand what Ruth just declared? She's saying, I will do whatever you say, dear mother. I'm willing to do whatever you say. If you say go, go home, I'll go home. But please don't ask me to go home. Please, I want to be where you are. I want your God to be my God. Where you die, I'll die there too. Only death can divide us. And even then, we can share the same grave, hope in the same family redeemer together. Her life of selfless service and determined devotion became a living testimony throughout the little town of Bethlehem. Her life sang from the harps of the shepherd David as he guarded his flock in the same fields. And the angels in heaven declared the amazing grace of truth's faith, Ruth's faith, and love as they proclaimed years later above the same fields, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace toward men of goodwill. You must Your most tra traumatic test may become the field of Boaz if you trust and obey. The field of Boaz. The field of Boaz. And what the, appears to be a random barley field became the most important stage in Ruth's life because she loved, she claved to her covenant. Nothing would separate her from the love of God. Even Boaz recognized the truth of her testimony. Ruth's life of separation, consecration, and devotion spoke to the entire village. 
Listen to his declaration in verses 10 through 12 of chapter 2. You can turn just right there, chapter 2. This is what Boaz says. We'll get to that in verses 10. Then she fell on her face, bowed herself to the ground. Get the picture? And said unto him, Why have I found grace in thine eyes, that thou shouldest take knowledge of me, seeing I am a stranger? And Boaz answered and said unto her, Ah, hallelujah. It hath fully been shewed me all that thou hast done unto thy mother-in-law since the death of thine husband, and how thou hast left thy father and thy mother in the land of thy nativity, and art come unto a people which thou knewest not heretofore. Hear this. The Lord recompense thy work, and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel, under the, whose wings thou art come to trust. Hallelujah. What have I done for you, says Boaz? What I've done for you is a small thing compared to the great gift you have given your mother-in-law. That's what Boaz is saying here. By immersing yourself into a life of faith and trust in the Lord God of Israel, you have come under his protection, even as a chick seeks safety from the danger above by resting under the wings. Jesus says in Matthew 10, 37, Matthew 10, 37, verses through 39. Recompense. He that loveth father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it. Come. And he that loses his life for my sake will. How is that? This is true recompense. It's an unexpected and undeserved peace with God. The Hebrew root for recompense is the same word. It's shalom, which is a deviation of shalom. In Israel, when you greet somebody on the Sabbath, you say what? Shalom. Huh? Shabbat shalom. And you respond, shalom shabbat. Peace in Israel. Recompense. That's what you're asking that the Lord, just like Boaz the blessing that Boaz gave to Ruth. Shabbat Shalom. A peace, a reconciliation. Uh, now how is it that only in losing one's life, a recompense of eternal life is found in Messiah? Why is it so hard to grasp? Could it be that we hold on to things too tightly? Leave it behind. Leave it all behind. So why is it so hard? Well, perhaps part of the answer can be found in this encounter with Christ in Matthew 19. Matthew chapter 19. Matthew 19, starting in verse 16. Why is it so hard to leave it all behind? And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is, God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. Now, eight years ago, that phrase stopped my Sunday keeping walk in the tracks. It was eight years ago. Could it be that I should consider leaving Sunday worship behind and obey his commands? All his commands? That was it. 
I had to give in to the word of the Lord. And a few months later, I was baptized in the Greater Randolph Seventh-day Adventist Church in San Antonio, Texas. I left that behind for a new uncharted course. Case solved, right? Hallelujah, I'm worshiping on the Sabbath. Huh? Well, yet um, I sort of ignored the rest of this scene here found in chapter 19. We continue the following verses, verses 18. He said unto him, which? Jesus said, thou shalt not do murder, thou, thou shalt do no murder, right? Thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The young man said unto him, all these things I've kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? And here's the part that I really, really overlooked. It's very, very powerful. Verse 21. Jesus said unto him, If thou be perfect, go and sell all that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And then what? And come and follow me. But. Watch out for these buts. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful. For he had great possessions. We really don't know how much he had. But he f figured he had too much to give up. Great possessions were weighing him down. And then Jesus turns and tells his disciples, Verily I say unto you, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter in the kingdom of heaven. And when I heard this again for the first time with open ears, I was stunned. If I would be perfectly saved... Sell? Sell? No wonder his disciples responded. What's the next response? And when the disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed. And they said, who then can be saved? But Jesus beheld them. When Jesus looks you in the eye and beholds your heart, watch out. Jesus looks you in the eye, beholds your heart. Get ready for a change. Amen. Get ready. And he said unto them, With men, this is impossible. But with God, some things are possible. What? Okay. I just want to make sure I'm hearing it myself. All things are possible. In other words, what is impossible with man is possible with God. Now, I cannot remove the crimson stain of sin and lust for things from my inner life. Only Yahweh himself, the Lord of hosts, can part the Red Sea of my unbelief. Only Adonai can deliver me from the flesh pots of Egypt and lead me to an unseen promised land. All things are possible in Christ when I acknowledge the impossible position of my stony heart. I told you this was personal. Only then am I free to love as he loved. When I'm free of things. Free of things. Peter protests. Verse 27. Then Peter said, answered and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have, therefore? Thank you, Peter. Exactly what was on my mind. What's in it for me? I got a great position. I, they voted me as elder. I can do all this great stuff. I worship on the Sabbath. What's in it for me, right? What shall we have, therefore? Hmm. 
Verse 28, Jesus said unto them, remember, he's looking them in the eye. Verily I say unto you, that which thou have followed, that ye which have followed me. You see that which in there? That which? That's conditional, right? That ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone that hath forsaken, here they are, houses, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for whose sake? shall receive an hundredfold and shall inherit what? Recompense. Recompense. Could it be that when God asks you to leave something, everything behind, that he himself has something better? You see, they didn't know it. But Naomi... And Ruth and Boaz, they died and never discovered that they were the progenitors of the family of the Messiah. Could it be that when God asks you to leave something, everything, that he has something better? Amen. This indeed is the same recompense Boaz prayed over Ruth's humble heart under whose wing she had come to trust. Amen. You see that? God is able and willing to give more than we ever give away. Now, about those 12 thrones and 12 tribes, we'll leave that for another sermon. Christ will give himself when you give self away and everything attached to it. Here's a promise framed by this context. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, put your name in there, whosoever believeth in him should not perish, recompense, but have everlasting life. Jesus gave himself away on the cross and it was love that kept him there. How much more must we be willing to give as much? What a double dose of eternal peace multiplied by a hundred, hundreds of priceless inheritance that lasts forever. That's a description of recompense. Naomi, Ruth, and Boaz, all three, released their treasures. All three of them. They, they released their hopes, their lives, their way of life. They all would rather obey the voice of their master than listen to the voice of reason and retain respect, reward, and riches. Yes, my reason says, keep it. Keep it. The Lord may have use for it somewhere. My conscience says, leave it. Leave it all behind. And what does it mean to forsake all that you have? What do you really have? Really? Pockets without holes, debts, mortgages, wells without water, clouds without rain? What does it mean to be the Lord's disciple? You realize that everything that you have right now will be left behind. That nice suit that you have will go on to the Salvation Army or maybe a relative. That, that old car that you're driving, when you're gone, someone else will get it. Nothing that you have or own. So why don't we give it all away already? Amen. Since it's going to be passed on. I, I, I face the same thing, you know. My mother had three closets full of clothes 
and she could lay away one thing at a time. And when she passed away, you know what I was burdened with? I had all that stuff. And you know where we ended up? Salvation Army. Why do, why do we hold on to so much stuff? Rather obey the voice of their master. What does it mean to forsake all? Listen to what Jesus says regarding being a disciple. Luke 14, 31, 33. I see this as a conditional of discipleship. Discipleship. What's a disciple? Hmm? You, know, you see what's the root word inside of discipleship? Disciple? Hmm? Discipline. And here Jesus is encouraging us to count the cost, but also gives it as a condition. In verse 31 of chapter 14 of Luke, Jesus says, Or what king going to make war against another king sitteth not down first and consulteth whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth in a message and desire conditions of peace. Here it is. So likewise, whosoever he be of you, that's you and me, that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. I repeat, so likewise, whosoever be of you, that forsaketh not all? Did he say that? Lord, have mercy on my soul. You cannot be my disciple. Looking at this example that Jesus just gave, we, we, you have to consider we never, we'll never have enough troops to wage war against the captain of the Lord's host. Can you imagine that? Is that, that just doesn't make sense to me. And here, the gentleman, when he sees 20,000 coming, he takes account and says, well, mm, this is a, we better surrender. We better surrender because there's not enough to overcome. And that's how I felt when the Lord invaded my territory. I thought I could fight and win. Then I realized I was like going to fight a losing battle. And I said to Jesus, I surrender. Help me. <laughs> I don't have enough to overcome your love. I don't have enough to overcome your requests. Yes, I'll be a disciple, but help me. Help me. If we truly consider our ways and take inventory of all our wealth, we will find a famine in the lands of our life the shells of our heart bare of any spiritual life. Surely, commandment keeping will count for something, right? But, look at it. The first and tenth commandment points to my tendency to want more than I, we, than I have and hold on to things that we don't have. Uh, isn't that it? Commandment one says what? No other gods. Commandment ten says don't covet. And I find myself doing both. So I left the clamor of the city for a beautiful, calming place of, in the country, the liberty of clean living, clean air, clean water, clean acres. Did I find it? No. Honestly, no. We're called to be gleaners, not preachers. Like Ruth. A worker in the sweaty fields, not in a builder of a cozy cottage in the country. How much do you trust God? To leave it all behind and follow him into an unseen future? 
And I must ask myself the same question. How much, honestly, can I afford to invest into a life of unseen things that looks like a dark shadow? If I was truly sincere, could I, would I make a full commitment to the first love of my heart and not go away in sorrow like the young man, holding on to all my things? Mercy. Or would I be like this man who found a land with a treasure? Jesus said in Matthew 13, 44, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a treasure hid. You get that? Hid in a field. The which, when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and does what? A little bit. And selleth all that he hath, and does what? Today I must be honest with myself and ask, where is the fruit of my fire? Where's my joy? What happened to the passion I possessed for Jesus? Do I truly love my wife, my farm, my dog? More than Christ? Am I able at this moment to consider selling all and giving all to the poor of Israel for the sake of the gospel? not supposed to be easy it's not supposed to be easy from the beginning of my Christian walk I've always wanted to be a missionary I wanted to be where God wanted to be to do his work to give of his love whatever I had in my heart that was years ago when I fancied myself to be a missionary Today, I wonder where the passion is gone. Where's my first love? Is he couched in the folds of my country cottage like a lost coins in the folds of a sofa? Or is he lost in the fields of selfishness and pride on my farm? How can I buy the field of treasure if I don't sell the farm? If you lost it, it's most likely where you left it. If you lost it, it's most likely where you left it. So the last few months, the Lord has really been hard on me. I cannot seem to find the fire, no matter how hard I look, for a match. But he reminded me of this. I met a man named Paul Henry Yoder, he had a beautiful farm and a beautiful family, five children, very young family. He owned a beautiful 32-acre farm with a spring, two houses, and lots of hardwood trees. It was for sale. And I asked him, why are you selling such choice property? You know what he said? He said, I have to sell everything, to leave it all behind and sell everything and, and the dog to fulfill a call in his life to be a missionary in Liberia, Africa. Africa, are you crazy? The farm is beautiful. This farm is beautiful. And the dog too? Yes, but all has to go because the Lord has called me to be a missionary to Africa. Well, who do you suppose bought the farm? I did. I bought the farm for a missionary. I would have loved to have been he. Um, and I have to ask myself, could I do that again? I mean, the Lord really pierced me. I was the one who bought the farm. And he's the one obeying the, his conscience and doing what the Lord has called him to do. And the Lord checked me 
I said, Brad, can you do the same thing? Give it all up and obey what God has told you to do. And remember the fires on the beaches of Fort Lauderdale and seeing souls saved for Jesus. Should we prevail in the plains of Midian? As Moses did, and name his firstborn son Gershom, a stranger in a strange land? Or am I willing to fall on my knees and exclaim as Ruth did, I'm a stranger in the Lord's land under whose wings I have come to trust? So please listen to Ruth's passions of voice once more as we read in verses 16 and 17 of Ruth chapter 1. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following thee, for whither thou goest I will go, and whither thou lodgest I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. Where thou diest I will die, and where will I, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more so also, if aught but death part thee and me. I'm not going back, says Ruth. Everything is behind me. Everything I have is yours. Can you make the same in passion, please? And leave it all behind? Let's all consider the condition of discipleship as Jesus placed it there in verse 33. So likewise, whosoever... Be he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath. He cannot be my disciple. What's holding you back from being a disciple? What's holding you back? Jesus is there. The labors are few. He's calling. Leave it all behind. Leave it all. All he has to offer is eternal life. All he has to offer is the joy of a recompense of being with him forever. O oh, Lord God of Israel, in whose wings we come to trust, make it so as we leave it all behind. Amen. 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 Closing him, I'll go where you want me to go. Five seventy three. Help us, O oh Lord, be gleaners of the Word of God as we submit our lives to you as we care for the little ones in our arms and those who are sick. Help us, O oh Lord, to be so unselfish that we're willing to give it all away. For your sake, O oh Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.